We watched WWE Extreme Rules October 8th, 2022. It opened with the Brawling Brutes versus Imperium. Now, this is the first match on the show. It's actually the last match I watched because as it was going on, in addition to everything else going on in the fall, I was watching the Seattle Mariners win a playoff series for the first time in the lifespan of people like Nick Wayne and Thea Hale. So it's a pretty big deal. <laughs> But I eventually I watched this match and very happy I did. Is it, it true, ruled. Vinny, that this was the longest streak of a team not getting into a playoff in sports I, I, history? I believe, I believe it was the active streak in uh, in in, in uh, the big four American sports of Major League Baseball, the National yes. Football League. Not, not just National. baseball, everybody. Every sport. Yeah, That's National. how much our team fucking sucks. Yes. yes. Uh, now? Well, I mean, they, they made the, it, but I... The ensuing two decades. Sure, <laughs> yeah. I mean... <laughs> We, I, we can't really prove they don't suck. They might have just got lucky this year. Well, they, they, they we'll have to look for a series. trend, right? I see. I yes, see. we have to look for a trend. If they go 40 more years without getting the, into the playoffs, they fucking suck. Was it 95 right? that they were pretty good, though, too? From 95 to 2021, they were a very good team. Yeah. Never won championship, but they were a very good team. And then since the two decades since, they have suck. not been good. <laughs> no. Suck, 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 suck. So it was fun. Anyway. Uh, Brawling Boots is appearing. I'm very glad I watched this because it was friggin' awesome. 100%. Now, I will say the first two or three minutes had me pulling my heart and screaming, not through the fault of any of these six men, but when you do a chaotic multi person brawl and it's the opener on a WWE show and they're doing tons of camera cuts anyway and they're trying to keep up with you by doubling or perhaps tripling the number of camera cuts. I was out of my goddamn mind for the first two or three minutes of this. And, and it wasn't just that they cut the camera. It's that they missed stuff, too, somehow. That's the point. Uh, it, it, I'm, I'm already out of, out of my mind. And there's a one point where, like, Seamus is on the floor, like, points and runs. But he runs off camera. Right. So instead of running, instead of cutting to where he is, we cut to Gunther posing. <laughs> Suddenly, everyone starts cheering. We cut back to where Seamus was. He's posing. What happened? I don't know. I can't tell you. This happened over... And over and over again. You know, Which, at one point, did an enzigiri. The camera cut twice while he was in midair. I can't. Uh, I, I don't want to. I don't want people to write a story about this because I'm just speculating here because I don't know what's going on. But I do know that about a week ago there was a rumor that old Kevin Dunn was done, and it turns out it wasn't true. Hmm. He's he's still Not based on this. Yeah, yeah. But it was. But well, no. Here's my point. They've been missing a lot. In the last week or so, they missed a ton of shots on SmackDown. I think on Raw as well. They missed a ton on this show. So I don't know what's going on. Like, he's still there. I mean, maybe there was something to the rumors where, like, somebody else was put in a position or something like that. or And then people got an idea that he was gone, but he wasn't. But, yeah, this is not. Uh, this was not just this show. They, they've missed shots on SmackDown. They missed shots on Raw. It's been a fairly recent thing, so I don't know what's going on, but there are there are fewer cuts. Absolutely. They still do a lot of cuts. Yes. But if you've been paying attention, they it's not like, you know, there was a there was a clip that I I think was it was somewhere on the internet. I don't remember where it was, but you could actually hear done. It was what he was doing the the yeah, yeah. calling the it was like four, three, one, one, four, three. He really started going that fast and going kuh, kuh, kuh. That's lessened, but yeah. it's still there. And and they haven't they've they've cut way out on the zoom in and zoom out. Like yeah, there's less zooming, yep. and or jumping up and down with the camera. They they've stopped a lot of that, which uh, and which is funny is because good. there was another brawl. I think it might have been on SmackDown, and and it was a brawl where they normally are like making the camera go up and down. Right, and I'm watching it, and the camera's sort of a little bit going up and down, but not a lot. And I was wondering if like I wonder if these poor camera guys like they can't help themselves anymore. <laughs> like, like every now and then you'll see a guy who leaves WWE and he doesn't have to say all this these dumb words anymore, but he has a promo somewhere else and he still says all of the fucking words because they've been doing it for so long they can't help themselves anymore. Yeah, I didn't have to take Dramamine watching the show, so I was happy. It, it, it did settle down, like I said, after the first three or four minutes and as uh, Imperium started to take over and then the match just got great. So they had the psychology of this match was taken from a, a, a lot of Lucha six men. Excuse me, a lot of trios matches, I should say, uh, that I have seen, where there's a captain and his two flunkies on each side. And though it is, uh, by rule, a trios match, and, and uh, all six of these men had times to shine, in the end, there was one captain on each team, and it was going to come down to Gunther and Sheamus to decide who really won or lost this thing. 
So they take out uh, Imperium did early on. They actually took out Seamus first. They uh, threw him into and onto a bar that was at ringside because if I didn't mention it, this was a good old fashioned Donnybrook match. So they had oak barrels and the actual like marble bar and uh, yeah, whatever. You serve drinks, not like a rebar right. or anything. Not like a crowbar or a workout bar, that kind of thing. Thank you, Greg. An actual uh, piece of furniture bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they th- they throw him into that. He disappears for a while. They take out Ridge, Ridge Holland. So now it's three on one against Butch. And Butch takes in the situation, shrugs. He don't care. He's in a fight anyway. He gets into a fight, but there's three of them. They whip his ass. And Imperium strikes their pose in unison, all three of them. It's been a dominant outing so far for Imperium here in this opening six or seven minutes. But then Seamus begins to stir. He tosses the bar off of him. The two flunkies are sent to attack. He dispatches them. We have the Seamus Gunther stare down with Gunther in the ring and Seamus on the floor. Place is just going nuts. This feud is the best thing in WWE right now. Uh, they, they, there's, uh, they go back and forth. Seamus gets the clover leaf. Gunther is waving to his goon squad for help, but they're not there. People are losing their shit. Ludwig Kaiser, who I don't think I mentioned this, this dude has gotten shredded. Yeah, lately. Ludwig Kaiser is shredded. Jesus. By the way, I want to mention is is uh, you you were mentioning Gunther. His gimmick is the ring general. Mm-hmm. But man, if you watch this match, he was a ring general. Oh, he's yeah. directing traffic. He's telling this guy to get here. He's telling this guy to get there. He's something else. So Kaiser has to break up this uh, cloverleaf using the shillelagh. Even though they claim the mat is sacred, they were desperate and had to use a weapon. Uh, we get we have a spot that everyone like is it, it, it's a sextuple down, but everyone's down to their bellies. And as the goons all start to fight from there, Gunther and Seamus just go forehead to forehead and slowly rise like monsters out of the deep, and they start clubbering each other. So after Imperium took over early, and they were holding uh, isolating Seamus and torturing him three on one. Later, as the brutes turn, they're holding Gunther and torturing him and whacking him in the shillelagh. It all comes full circle. Everyone gets that coming. And uh, so uh, Vinci is isolated at one point. They, they, they isolate Gunther. They give it to him. Uh, Giovanni Vinci interferes to save Gunther, but that just leads to Vinci being isolated. He's triple teamed forever, and they're holding him. And, and Seamus is playing cheerleader, fighting the crowd, the best baby face on the roster. And he finishes Vinci with a bro kick. And this is done. Besides just being an awesome, awesome, awesome match, Seamus was so great here as the baby face cheerleader. By the end of this, I was like, it's 2022, and I have seen Seamus have a thousand to one start and stop pushes on top. But damn it, he needs to beat Roman. <laughs> I'm ready for that at this point. He was so cool here. Well, bro, he ain't going to be a Roman. Because, quite frankly, he couldn't even beat Gunther. And I thought he was going to win. I thought it makes no difference. He can win the Intercontinental title, put the title back on Gunther next month, two months, whatever you want to do. But instead, Gunther beat him on SmackDown. So I don't anticipate him beating Roman, but I suppose you never know that I would not uh, hold my breath. Really enjoyed this match. Uh, It's a good way to... I haven't seen WWE in a very long time. And it was nice to come back to the less camera cuts, less shaking of the camera. Uh, a, an amazing white meat baby face, Seamus. Very white meat. Uh, yeah, very. Almost translucent. <laughs> He's pretty really. white. <laughs> and uh, and Butch, uh, what a superstar that guy is. Dude, yeah. Moon salts off the keg barrels, and he's so great. Dude, this uh, this match, I will say that the last 10 minutes of the edge match were awesome. Yeah. Not the first 20 minutes, but the last sure. 10. Yes. But, uh, you know, aside from that, you know, this was by far, by far, the best thing on the show. Sure. I would say almost by miles. And that's not to say it was a bad show. That's just how good this match was. Mm-hmm. This was the best wrestling match in the show. You know what the, I liked about it, too? The angle thing may have been the best yes. theater. It was the best, the best match, right. the best yes. wrestling match. Yes. And what I liked about it is we used to talk about, we used to compare AEW to, uh, to WWE, and we would talk about how, you know, if, if they promise you a barbed wire match in AEW, God damn, you're going to get what's, what's promised. Whereas, you know, sometimes they promise some stipulation match in WWE, and I mean, they do it, but it's like a vanilla watered down version of it. This was a, this was billed as a good old fashioned Donnybrook, and fucking they not only delivered, they overachieved 
That's what I like to see in my stipulations. You promise me something, and you give me even more than you promised. That's what they gave me here. Liv Morgan versus Ronda Rousey. So this is one of those matches that makes me think wrestling has just passed me by. Yeah. Liv, as far as I could tell, is supposed to be the babyface. Now, sure. it was, it was uh, I think it was an Extreme Rules match or Street Fighter, whatever. But so it was anything goes, whatever you want to call it. But even though she is the babyface, she wants to fight Ronda Rousey using a bat, a baseball bat. And as we learned throughout the match, it's not a gimmicked baseball bat either. It's a weapon. And Ronda Rousey's response is, okay, use the bat. I will fight you with my bare hands, and I will kick your ass anyway. Vinny, may I interrupt you for a moment? Please. This is, this is one of those deals where you're not watching Ron SmackDown. This Liv Morgan character is, in fact, supposed to be a babyface. But they have done the shittiest job of late with Liv Morgan. What you said is absolutely true. But what you did not mention is that on SmackDown last week, they did an angle where Ronda Rousey cut a promo and she said, I am the most dangerous, unarmed woman on earth. Okay. Imagine what I can do with a weapon. Hmm. This led to an angle later where Liv showed up after Ronda's match with the baseball bat. The baby face. Liv went after Ronda with the bat. Ronda avoided the attack and beat the shit out of Liv Morgan, okay? Okay. Yeah. So, I ranted about that at the time, because, you know, Liv Morgan, I think, did an interview recently. She said something like, you know, I'd be scraped through thumbtacks to show how much I love this business or something like that. And I just thought, if you love this business that much, instead of being scraped through thumbtacks, what you should do is tell people no and stand up for yourself and if someone comes up with a fucking dumb idea like you, the babyface, are going to attack somebody with a bat, but they're going to beat your ass barehanded, you say, fuck no, I'm not doing that. Or, hey, can we do this or whatever? Because she did it. And now, after that, it's even worse. Now she comes to this pay-per-view and knowing that with a weapon, she got her ass kicked last time. The, the match literally starts with her desperate to get that weapon again. And she's running from Rhonda, and she's desperate to get her weapon, and she finally gets the weapon, and she gets her ass kicked again. Yeah. I'm like, what in the fuck is this? And it just continued on throughout the match. She got beaten, 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 beaten. So Rhonda does beat her ass with, well, excuse me, even though Liv has a bat, Rhonda beats her ass with her bare hands anyway for a while. Eventually, they're both using the bat, and I know it was not a gimmick bat because Liv came off the stairs, Ronda caught her in the ribs with it, and there's a big nasty welt. But that probably frightened both of them because every other time they used this bat, since it was not a gimmick bat, they were obviously plainly gently poking each other with it. This is this is plainly a worked fight. This, they, this is not going well. They're doing lots of choking with cables and stuff. They're trying to use chairs. The chairs are falling out of position. It's, all, it's just a very, very sloppy, hardcore stuff. So Liv puts the table up in the ring. She puts Ronda through the table and gets, gets a two count off of that. But Ronda, in the process of kicking out, turns this into an armbar. Fine. That's all cool. Uh, Liv tries to, while being armbarred, do the lift up into her powerbomb from the table because the, there's still half of the table in like a triangle position. So they tried to powerbomb her through that, but Liv is, uh, just didn't get her up high enough and didn't really go through the table. That's kind of went into it for a while. And then we get about, I don't know, 90 seconds or two minutes of the wackiest grappling transitions you've ever seen. Uh, Vinny, I'm appalled. These were not <laughs> grappling transitions. I don't know. What, what would you, please, please. I, I can't. Better terminology. I literally can't. It was two people trying to do a spot. Neither of them could figure out what they were doing. They're yelling at each other. They're trying to assist each other. And it went on forever. I'm not exaggerating when I say 90 seconds to two minutes. No, you're not. And it, was and it looked forever. like two people cooperating to try to do something that they couldn't do and i'm like and listen i don't want to talk about this or that but fuck give up and put on a fucking choke or an arm bar who gives a fuck 
I don't care what your idea for the finish was. This was so fucking off the rails that Ronda should have just been like fucking. She, I don't want to say she's shot on her, but trust me, Ronda can get you in an armbar from anywhere. She should have just got her in a fucking armbar, told her to tap, and got this fucking thing over with. Because that was crazy. Well, eventually, the long long story into a long story at this point, but they she hooked something sort of kind of resembling a short arm scissors. They called it a biceps crusher. And the pain to Liv's biceps was so severe that she apparently blacked out. I was dying because on, on Rampage, did you watch Rampage? I have not seen Rampage. There's a, a I don't even remember who it was, but somebody does a, a move and Jericho and Regal are on commentary. And Jericho identifies it as a short arm scissors and Regal identifies it as a biceps slicer. Aha. Uh-huh. God bless William Regal. He was 100% wrong. It was a short arm scissors. Then it was Yuta. Then on this show, we have another move, which they claim is a, I think they, what they call it, a bicep cutter. Uh, I think that's, bicep it cutter. Be a slicer. It might have been. Sl- uh, well, anyway, slicer, they, cutter, crusher. They, they, they explained that it was a move attacking the biceps, which caused Liz to go unconscious. Yes. So that's now two shows on successive days where somebody decided that something was a bicep slicer, and in both cases, they were incorrect. Although, to be fair, in this case, I didn't know what the fuck it was either. But what I do know is a bicep slicer does not cause you to pass out with a smile on your face. Trust me. Now, was uh, was a smile because the table was jammed up into her face, or was she actually grinning? I don't know. I, I will Maybe she was th- laughing at how long it took to get her to this spot. <laughs> I, I don't will, know. I will leave that to the judgment of Brian. From what I understand, they're doing some kind of angle where she is a little Looney Tunes. They are? I've, that's why I was... I didn't oh. know that. <laughs> it's fucking news uh, to me if that's what they're doing. Uh, I don't know. It's been suggested perhaps that she will end up... Because uh, apparently in the, the uh, main event angle, the main event entrance... Uh, there was one shot that included the new star with the what appeared to be the women's tag belts next to him. And somebody suggested it may have just been fans of the belts. But everyone had wild theories about who... Well, the, my who impression the is on. that there was a reason that they had the belts next to that individual. Mm-hmm. But my presumption is that the woman in question is going to end up being Alexa. This will mm-hmm. all tie together with Alexa and the Fiend. Yeah. And apparently, Bo Dallas. Okay. Yeah, he's on his way back. Oh, thank God. Yeah. Um, the stuff with the bat in this match was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, using the bat over and over and over and over again. Yes. And nobody is black and blue. Nobody is scarred up. Nobody yeah. is knocked out unconscious. Um, they should have used the bat very sparingly and maybe only at the end. Um but they used it throughout, and it was just, I could not suspend my disbelief. And it, it was, you know, again, visually obvious they were not swinging this bat like... Uh, exactly. Uh, like the Seattle Mariners, for example. Drew McIntyre versus Karrion Cross in a strap match. I so, guess I was the only one, huh? What's that? I thought this match was, was all right. Pretty good, I in thought, fact. I thought it was all right, yeah. That, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a good, uh, that's a good way to put it. It, it was two guys, for, you know, if, if this went 12 minutes, about 10 of it was two guys just hitting each other with the strap as hard as they could. And it was loud, let me tell you. I mean, it, I've, I've, I have heard and delivered belt shots where it's a very loud slapping sound. Theirs were deep bass thuds <laughs> to the strikes these guys are doing with this, with this strap here. Um, I did feel like it was the second match in a row where it was just two guys hitting each other weapons or two people hitting that's each other weapons. That's extreme rules, dude. Time. Well, that's a bad idea for pay-per-view, which is the well, same match over. Uh, this is a yeah. much better version of it, but it was redundant. It was redundant. So my takeaway from this match is this is my first time seeing Karrion Cross wrestle with hair. Right. Every other match I've seen, he was shaven bald. And I had seen him do promos, maybe angles or sneak attacks with the hair. So I knew he had hair, but this is the first time watching it. And he comes out doing his entrance... And I thought, well, Cal looks just like another guy who doesn't look bad. But the longer this match went, and the more <laughs> doofier his hair got, the more he fussed with it, the harder it was to take anything going on here seriously. This haircut is not a winner. He needs to lose a hair match on Raw immediately. See, I didn't mind this at all because uh, Paisley's new obsession is space. It's in yeah. outer space. All right. 
And so we've been watching uh, NASA videos on YouTube. And you'll never guess what uh, NASA video came up today. Wacky hair in space? How do astronauts use the potty in uh, space? Yeah, 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 she, yeah. Was, she was just fascinated. Well, and so anyway, uh, you know, there's an astronaut who's explaining how you use the uh, potty yeah. in space. And they're in space. And so her hair ah, is okay. just like oh, all over the place. It was actually, if you guys ever watch any of these, uh, this has nothing to do with the wrestling, but go watch some, some uh, you know, educational videos from astronauts in space. Because uh, I don't know if you know this about space, but there's no gravity there. And what? so, yeah, it's like this guy, he's, he's, he's doing a Q&A from fucking outer space. And so he's holding the mic. And then someone asks his question, and so literally he just lets go of the mic, and it just starts floating around. And then he's trying to show what a barf bag is, and so he tears open this barf bag, and then he he you know he goes to like throw the bag over his shoulder, but the fucking bag just keeps flying up, and he looks up and goes, uh oh, you know. It's, and then this guy's got his necklace on, and the necklace is just floating around his head. I just I was like, I got to watch more of these. This is awesome. And I learned how astronauts use the uh, potty in space. Which involves suction. Of course yeah. it does. Holy it's an important shit. thing. It's something you have to think about if I'm, you're going to be in space for a while. Well, I changed my mind about going to space after watching this video. Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. Or do you want to go even more now? <laughs> no, definitely not. No, the suction is on uh, not that end. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> right. So uh, the good news is the Masters Pinder submission rules. They didn't bother with dragging the four corners or any of that nonsense. Uh, the match was very fine. It was two big, scary guys beating the snot out of each other. Certainly not going to complain about that. Now, the finish. The finish. Uh, they're having this... It's a strike exchange like New Japan, only they're losing the strap instead of their elbows. Drew eventually gets the better of that, hits the future shock DDT, goes to the corner to hit the Claymore to finish this bastard off, but Scarlet gets in the ring, blocks his path, and then just maces him. Sprays him in the face with mace. Now, it's no DQ, right? So, okay, it's done, fine. But why didn't you do that 10 minutes ago? <laughs> if you're going to cheat anyway, you could have done it another way. So, uh, uh, McIntyre is blind. Well, it's the same thing in that Edge match. It's like when, when Judgment Day came out. They came out fucking 20 minutes in the match. Yes, I, I, yes. That was some real heat. It's like, yeah. why don't you fuckers come in 18 minutes ago? Get, get this show on the road, bros. So uh, McIntyre is blinded and wailing in agony, and Karrion Cross has uh, two finishes, apparently. The Cross Jacket, yeah. which I don't think he ever got, but he hit the Cross Hammer, which is the, uh, I think it's the Hidden Blade. That, uh, it's pretty similar to the Hidden Blade, yeah. It's a much of a cooler name. Anyway, elbows him in the head and pins him, and uh, there you go. You know, here's the thing with this match. I mean, was it a great match? No, it wasn't a great match. But what was what was the idea behind this match? The idea was... Let's do what we can to try to get this cross guy over. And Drew's job was to not go out there and get squashed or anything like that, but it was to put this guy over. And I thought that his selling was great. I thought he did everything he could to try to get this guy over. And I think the whole I think the whole idea behind the mace spot is I think they were going to do an injury angle off the fireball, but as we talked about, the fireball was so lame that Drew didn't even sell it. He, he he basically called his own audible, didn't sell it, and then they continued their angle or whatever. So I think that they did the mace here to the eyes again to uh, to do whatever they were going to do involving the fireball. So what that is, I don't know, but I thought that he did a good job. I thought Cross looked fine. I mean, did he look like he should be challenging Roman Reigns? No, but I thought for... You know, what I've seen of him in the past, I thought he did fine in this match. I thought it was good. Yeah, I didn't mind this match at all. Uh, I know some people hated it. Some people online thought it was very boring. I I thought it was fine. Um, it's a good thing Scarlet's there with uh, Cross for obvious reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, without uh, without her, I don't know that he would be much of an act. So, But the two of them together... Fantastic. She, she's a huge part of it. He, she, she sets them apart with lip syncing the song and all that, and and uh, of course they they've got experience with you know, how the devilish women interfere in a match and gets the more heat on everybody, and it all works very well. It all works very well. <laughs> uh, we had a wacky skit with Miz, a series of wacky skits where he's constantly on the phone with Maurice, promising to get a meeting with Triple H, and always being interfered with by Gritty, the Philadelphia Flyers mascot. And uh, this was the start of those. 
Bailey versus Bianca Belair in a ladder match. So they did lots of really cool things. They worked really, really hard. And everyone uh, was totally into the finish. When I look back on this, I can only remember the things they did that didn't look good. And specifically, Bianca, for a large part of this portion of this match, looked completely lost and needed to be almost literally led by the hand from one spot to the next. Uh... This is actually a different subject, but you know, Brian, you hate that spot where people run into the corners and bounce out and hit an offensive. Yes. Oh, I hate my, it. my pet peeve, it's similar. It's actually the opposite, I suppose. But why do you run at the ropes, throw on the brakes, and then turn and run anyway? Just hit the ropes and bounce back. Oh, and they do the misdirection spot? I guess. All I know is, hmm. I forget which one it was, one of them was running on the, towards the ropes Threw on the brakes, didn't hit the ropes, but then turned around and started to run. I'm like, if this was real, you'll run faster if you hit the ropes and bounce off them. There is no reason in storyline or in kayfabe to stop running, turn, and start running. It doesn't make any sense. Drives me nuts. Now, the bigger issue, that was a one-time thing. The bigger issue is they had a lot of very, very specific spots they wanted to do. And if they didn't go exactly right, they just tried it again or worked harder at it until it went exactly right. So they wanted to do a bit where Bianca would shove the ladder and it would push Bailey through the ropes and the ladder would land in just a certain way sitting on the floor resting up against the apron. Bailey fell through the ropes fine, but the ladder didn't go where it was supposed to. And so rather than just go outside and attack, Bianca picks up the ladder, sets it where it's supposed to, pushes it through the ropes, and then climbs out of the ring to attack Bailey and they go do whatever they're doing from there. Then they're down on the floor. And uh, there's a ladder sitting right where they are. There's a ladder in the ring. Bailey, uh, or excuse me, Bianca bends over Bailey. They have a very long conversation talking about the weather, family reunions, that sort of thing. Minutes pass. Eventually, Bianca runs into the ring, looks around, looks at the ladder that's in there, determines, no, this is not the correct ladder. She dives out of the ring, starts shuffling through ladders. There's a very specific ladder they have to use. And finally gets the ladder and bring it, brings it into the ring, and they do whatever they want to do. Uh, there's a much more stuff like this. Uh, many, many long conversations instead of spots, and the payoff is just, I'll throw a ladder at you, move. This happened repeatedly. And then the finish, uh, they're both uh, climbing up the top of the ladder. Bianca pulls, excuse me, Bailey pulls Bianca by the braid into the ladder, so Bianca falls down. But Bianca uses the braid to whip Bailey to the mat until she falls down. Fine. Now at this point, big ass ladder in the middle of the ring. Bailey prone on the floor. Bianca, the best athlete in the division, ready to scamper up this ladder and win the belt. That's not what happens. First, Bianca dances back and forth a little bit. Then she goes over to a corner where there is no Bailey, and she just doesn't do anything. Then she goes back to Bailey to get her instructions. Another speech is delivered. Specific instructions, chapter and verse. Bailey, uh, Bianca goes back to that first corner, sets up a ladder, but doesn't stand it up. It's just, it's just set up with things like a, like a V on its side. She goes to the opposite corner where now Bailey is, and Bailey has her own ladder. And the whole, I guess the whole payoff for this was just that Bianca does the KOD to Bailey who's holding a ladder so Bailey can fall on her face and smash it. So that ladder Bianca had just set up in the corner, she never ended up using. It was... I don't know what it was the plan was there. I don't know why they did that. And then finally, Bianca won. And Clamp won. Everyone would cheer to the end. And like I say, they worked really hard. And there was a lot of cool stuff. But all I could think about is the stuff that did not go right. Well, I thought that they worked very hard. And I thought that they largely tried to work a very safe match. There was still stuff that's dangerous because it's a ladder match. But I guess I guess I liked it more than you did. I, I, but I will honest, say... For as far as I can tell, everyone liked it more than I did. But I will say that overall, and it's kind of funny that I would say this, especially given what I'm going to say about the uh, next match. I wish I would just do ladder matches the way that Razor Ramon and Shawn Michaels did, where <laughs> you do a wrestling match, and you also have some spots involving a ladder. Sure. Now, it's like, we got to do a ladder match, and so let's come up with a bunch of spots. And that's what this was. And... You know, there is an expectation that you're going to do a bunch of spots and everything like that, but I think that sometimes it's better if you concentrate more on the psychology of the match and the ladders are like 
a little bit extra on top. Which is funny, because I watched that Edge match, and the first 20 minutes I just watched it and I thought, this feels like a match from 1994. It feels like a match from yes, the past. Yes, it does. It's funny you bring that up. We'll yeah, it feels yeah. like a match from the past. But in this in this instance, with the latter match, I think you should go back to the past. When the idea was, and this is actually prior to when ladder matches got really, really famous, but have a wrestling match and put some ladder spots in it. As opposed to, here's 55 spots involving a ladder, you know, how is Bianca going to remember half of them? She hasn't done any ladder matches. They've never even done a one-on-one ladder, ladder match, apparently, in WWE history. So, yeah, I thought it was, I thought they did, they worked hard. I thought they did a good job. It wasn't like a great ladder match or anything like that, but it was, I thought it was, I would go as far as to say, good. The finish took me completely out of it. She, Bianca goes to pick up Bailey. And she's holding on to the ladder. Yeah, why did Bailey just drop the ladder? She's on her shoulders, and she's holding the ladder like a dead spider. Just straight up, arms straight up in the air, holding the ladder. Okay, I don't know, maybe hit Bianca with the ladder? I don't know. That would help. (laughs) Something? No, she ended up eating the ladder. Whatever. (laughs) And yes, it is Edge versus Finn Balor. So... Finn, well, Edge has his big entrance, but it's, it's Edge's entrance. Finn has a new entrance with a scary, faceless, spiky mask and a modified version of his uh, old theme song and entrance poses, specifically designed to discourage fan interaction. Very neat, twisted idea that this is this is a warped, twisted version of Finn Balor that, that you're seeing here. And then they had a match. First, Michael Cole was citing Ole and Gene Anderson when this match began, which uh, it, the commentary is hugely improved in the past month or two since you know who is gone uh so that's a a huge plus but they can do things like cite history such as Ole and gene anderson and for a while this felt like a match Ole and gene anderson would have there was a lot of submission spots that they they actually did a figure four into a upside down figure four which mysteriously switches the leverage and they did fight back out of it and then they're crowd brawling for about 20 or 30 minutes and and then things we'll get to what happened but on a show called Extreme Rules, in the city of Philadelphia, this, in the end, was the ultimate ECW tribute. This was an ECW, original 1997-96 ECW match. It went really, really long. There was tons and tons of brawling. And in the end, there was a cast of thousands being involved in the match. And so even though as a quote-unquote wrestling match, it was, by, by the end, it was almost forgettable, but... As an exhibition, as entertainment, it was fucking great. Well, the thing with the first 20 minutes of this match to me was it felt like one of those old Triple H matches. Yes. Where, it. like, you watch it, and he's a, he's a great worker, and he does everything right, and there's good psychology and a story, but it just drags on and on and on and on. And it actually got me thinking that, you know, Edge Edge was was gone for what nine years or whatever it was. I believe so. He yeah. was forced into retirement, and he came back, and he missed nine years. And it was like uh, he's like Rip Van Winkle, where you know he, he woke up, and it's still nine years ago, and he's doing the style that he was doing before he left. And there's nothing wrong with it in the sense that it's it's correct and he does everything right and he's a good worker and everything but it's now 2022 and if you watch any any wrestling i mean things have changed dude there's an expectation among fans they want a little more excitement they want a little more movement they want and he's doing that same old style and i was watching it going my god well, there's nothing wrong with it, but dude, let's get to the point here. And then they brought out the Judgment Day. And from that point forward, like the next 10 minutes with the... And, and granted, you know, I don't like all the interference and everything, but the story that they told with the guys running in, the handcuffs, Ray, his I thought this was great. This was absolutely great. The last 10 minutes, this was great, great, great stuff. 
So Edge has hooked Finn Balor in the Educator or the Execution or whatever the hell it's called. It doesn't matter. Nobody recognizes the finish. Nobody cares. It was a match was very, very boring at this point. Judgment Day runs in to interfere, and Rhea Ripley is there to handcuff Edge to the ropes. And uh, there had been a point where uh, they were crowd brawling, and Finn dodged a spear, and Edge, I believe the idea was that he would go nuts first into the barricade. Mm-hmm. And uh, Cole said, you know, we're, this is in Philadelphia, that's a Sandman yeah, tribute or something. It reminds me of the Sandman or whatever he said. Really, that was more of a timer, Tommy Dreamer spot. And mm-hmm. I would say being handcuffed to the ropes and tortured for a while is also a Tommy Dreamer spot. Correct. Uh, so then we get the, the, the series of run-ins. Rey Mysterio runs out, his music plays, he's got a chair, he's whipping ass everywhere until his own son, dirty Dominic Mysterio, elbows him off the apron. Then we get Beth Phoenix out there running wild with a stick, destroying people. We do the obvious and uh, anticipated and successful face-off with Rhea Ripley, where the two big muscular women are just squaring, squaring off, the place is going crazy. And th- that was the moment where I decided, okay, this has been boring for a long time, but it was worth it to get where we are, because this is great now. So they're having this huge melee. Somewhere in there, Beth gets the key to the handcuffs. She's able to unlock Edge. Edge spears Damian Priest. Edge kicks Dominic in the nuts. A third Tommy Dreamer tribute. Uh, he spears Finn Balor repeatedly over and over. He tries to use a crowbar assisted submission hold to make Finn Balor say he quits. But Rhea takes out Beth with brass knucks and she's gone. Edge gets hit with South of Heaven. And they foot stomp his ribs over and over and over again. But he still won't quit. He tells them to go to hell. So Beth's out because she was hit with brass knucks. And so Finn orders Rhea Ripley to get the chairs, set her up for the one-woman concerto. Edge looks at his helpless wife. There's nothing he can do to help her. There's nothing she can do to help herself. He has no choice. And it kills him inside. It kills him inside. But he softly says, you win. I quit. It was almost too, it was almost too quiet. You want to hear those moments reverberating? But he said it. He quit. Finn Balor wins. And then, of course, these dirty, bastard, awful asshole heels, they smashed Beth that concerto anyway. This was so awesome by the end. It was it was a fantastic last 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I think it went 26 minutes or something like that. 29, 39. And I, don't, I hate to say it, but 1939 would have been a lot better. Ten, oh, yeah. ten less minutes before they came out, and you got a winner here. And at the end of the day, I'm not going to complain about it because, you know, it ended up being awesome. But I don't think we needed 20 minutes of uh, laying the groundwork to make that last 10 minutes awesome. So when Edge first came back, he came back and he wrestled Randy Orton in that WrestleMania match. That um, how long did it go? Like 40 minutes? 40, or something like that? five 40 minutes. 47 minutes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it felt longer. Uh, at about <laughs> at about the twenty minute mark, I went to Twitter and I wrote, "I like this storytelling," and then it kept going, and going, and going, and going. This was the complete opposite of that. It was boring at first, and then it got good. So yeah, I like this match a lot. Edge is an incredible worker, and he's very smart with his bumps. He's very smart with. It, the way he plays the crowd, and uh, I got nothing but respect for the guy. Let's see. We only go to the main event. Oh, really? It's a long quickly. train tonight, Craig. What's going on here? I didn't mention it ten minutes ago. Holy yeah. smokes! You know there are more than one train in the world. There's multiple trains. Oh I'm no! Telling you, God. Brian had a single train contingency plan. Oh, the concept really. of dual, perhaps even triple trains. Bro, those train loop. tracks in Woodenville you don't even have anymore. That you almost killed me on. They're long gone. No more trains around here. The yeah, tracks are still there. Nah, I don't know. I think they got rid of them tracks. Really? I think I, they they might have covered them up in the ones out by the Red Robin. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Oddly enough, that's where we ate before I tried to kill Brian. It, it is. It's exactly why. Hey, no better way to go out. You just ate a Red Robin. <laughs> Don't know where to go, but down from there. There's many better ways to go out, you fucking idiot. It was Red Robin. God. Perhaps on a, uh, a space station toilet. Golly, I could think of a hundred better places I'd rather eat before I went out. Oh, God. Miz goes to me with Triple H. Gritty is there. Miz beats up Gritty. Dexter Loomis is there. Dexter Loomis chokes Miz out. Fuck me. Is this ever going to end? You guys don't even get it. You don't watch these shows. Bro, I got it. He doesn't like the Miz. 
Can we fucking get to the point already? <laughs> Gritty or, or 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 Dexter or both? Fucking anybody. I'm sick of this. <laughs> get it over with. And we have the main Matt, event. Matt Riddle versus Seth Rollins in a fight pit match. So uh, they changed Riddle's music, and for a while he was uh, he had his own awesome theme in NXT. And they started teaming with Randy Orton, and they mashed them together. It was, this is a new one. It was different. And it sucks. I can't, I can't quite be sure. I think the idea might be that it's supposed to be Orton's music, but with Riddle's instruments. I don't know, dude. It's not as good. It's not his, as good. His original theme, I still remember Paisley dancing in the car to that song like for months on it. She loved that song. Now we just got this. It's like they took an actual catchy tune that that fit a guy's character. And they were like, we can't have that. Let's let's uh, generic it out. Now it's just eh, whatever. Is it, is it better than Seth Rollins or so? Well, yeah. Okay, I don't know what's going on with Seth's. I was right. singing no Seth's music the whole night. Yeah, I know, exactly. but it's not even a good song. I don't even. I, I still it's don't. Three, it's the same three notes over and yeah, over. Yeah, it's but. like this is a song. And he goes like this, like he, he's he's a fucking Conducting. conductor now, yes. and not a train conductor. Like he he has an orchestra. It's Seth kind of Rollins, well. Seth Orchestra Rollins. That's his new three, character. Three Maybe notes. Him. You could make a punk rock song very easily. Just saying. <laughs> this, he doesn't listen to some punk rock. I've heard. Yeah, maybe maybe he and uh, Ilya Dragunov can have a feud to see who gets to be the conductor because Ilya does the same thing to his music. So uh, Seth comes out and he's doing kind of I, I guess it was a like half assed RVD tribute. He had a ponytail on. He had an airbrush top with he did not wrestle in, and then he did have kick pads that looked like uh, RVDs. So uh, Daniel Cormier was the ref. They did not do a lot with him. They did a spot early on where. Uh, uh, Riddle was out of control, and Cormier tried to pull him off, and Riddle put his hands on him, so Cormier really pulled him off, and Riddle, Riddle respected him. And then the same thing with Seth. Seth was out of control. Cormier pulled him off, and uh, Seth put his hands on him, so Cormier was very violent about it and said, you don't have to fight me, you don't have to fight him. And they, they both had the same reaction, which was like, I have never seen a ref actually use authority before. They've always just let us do whatever we want. I'm not quite sure how to handle this. And by the way, when's the last time you had a quote-unquote celebrity referee where he didn't get a punch in at the end of the show. You were right. You'd figure at least they do it for the finish. Correct. We had more important things to do here tonight. I guess so. I guess so. So uh, they had they did some stuff uh, on the mat, and eventually Seth was uh, losing, I guess. So he tried to... You know the platform part of the fight pit uh, up, uh, up around the ring. It's almost like this, this is like a the mix of the scaffold and a cage match. Um... So he dares Riddle to come fight him up there, and of course Riddle does. They did sort of a powerbomb into the fence. They were very, very careful to not throw Matt Riddle against the side of this fence 20 feet off the ground as hard as they could, which I'm happy about because that would have been a true tragedy. Uh, there was a pedigree up there, up on the platform, a cutter out of nowhere up on the platform, and uh, finally uh, uh, Seth does a safe, controlled rolling stumble off the platform to the mat below and uh riddle <laughs> is posing up there and does the uh what, the, the broton he's posing up like he's gonna jump down on seth from the top of this platform and i think it was cole who screams get down you crazy man <laughs> well he got down he did get down but the crazy man got down by jumping as far as he could and doing a broton on to uh seth rollins and of course it's both dudes riddle selling is so awesome because he's a guy who's been in a lot of fights, actually, he knows what pain actually feels like and how you react when you're really in pain. So he's screaming, but not like an over-the-top cartoony way. He's screaming like a guy who's in pain. Did you see this move, though? He might have actually been in pain. He probably was. It did a lot of comfortable. I'd recommend it. it was I, funny. Shrieked, I shrieked so loud my dog left the room. I haven't seen her since. Yeah. He almost didn't really jump at all. He almost like fell at an ankle. <sighs> Because he didn't like, get a lot of air. He just kind of jumped out and had to kick his legs out from under him. And he landed a tailbone on the mat. I'm sure that was no fun. Uh, but he was walking around and doing stuff later, so I assume nothing nothing broke. And uh, he hooks a triangle. And Rollins, who is mighty... They, they, basically, they tried to do the same thing Liv Morgan tried to do and failed. 
But Rollins is a big, strong dude. So he can, from a triangle position, lift this guy up into powerbomb position. And he's slamming him into the fence repeatedly and slamming him into the mat as hard as he can. But Riddle won't let go of the choke. And eventually, Seth Rollins taps. It was a really, really good fight. I really, mm-hmm. really enjoyed it. But the crowd seemed uh, almost confused. They weren't sure where this was going. They, wouldn't know, they didn't know what to make of this fight pit match. It was not the type of WWE match they had been trained to see. But uh, I really liked it. I thought it was a very fun main event. I would say that I thought this match was good, but uh, it's just good. I mean, I saw that Donnie Brook earlier, and Donnie Bro- Donnie I, it was wasn't better. following the Donnie Brook. And, no, no, no. And honestly, if if you if you ask me, like you know, what should what should I watch this weekend? What should I watch from the pay per view? You know, nothing against this match at all, but I I wouldn't tell you like make sure you watch this one. But I would say to watch the Donnie Brook. It was fine. The finish, the Daniel Cormier thing was weird, especially because it didn't lead to Daniel Cormier and Seth having a fight. The wrestling was fine. Like, it was a solid match. You know, they they had a wrestling match in a fight pit. There was a brief moment at the beginning where they pretended like they were fighting and Seth just got leg kicked to death. I mean, I don't know. There was nothing wrong with it. But it was it was very. I mean, it was clear before the show that Bray was coming back. But you know, as soon as they did the finish, and and I knew this was the main event, it was like you got to have something more in this, don't you? And they did. They did. They did. Yeah. Yeah. This was the uh, the most okayest pay per view I've ever seen. Just everything was okay. I, I I was gonna go except the uh, goddamn Donnie Brook. I, I was, was more than great. okay. I was, was going great. to go thumbs in the middle, leaning down until I saw Donnie Brook, and I thought, okay, that this Donnie Brook makes the show a thumbs up on its own. Whatever else happened else is, is uh, irrelevant. So um, I do want to mention though about the fight pit. They were airing the uh, highlight videos of prior fight pits, which had only been done in NXT. The NXT fight pits were way better. So if you like this match, you'll love those. Go check them out. And does also, the, uh, does the Shamrock one with Owen count? I don't no, think that one or the one where Vince uh, beat uh, Shamrock. I don't think that counts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Those were Lions Den matches. This is a oh, yes. fight pit match. Fight pit's oh, okay. different. I miss Timothy Thatcher. Timothy yeah. Thatcher in that fight pit match. Well, in all of his matches was awesome. But the fight pit match he had with, I think it was Riddle, was, was, was tremendous fun. All right. So uh, they do the whole show wrap up. The graphic is on the screen, copyright 2022. And uh, they're saying goodbye. And Riddle is celebrating up on the ramp with DC. And the lights all go out. And Michael Cole is playing surprise announcer. <laughs> are we still on the air? Are we still live? Crowd can see where this is going. All the cell phones are out. All the fireflies we have around. We hear a man singing about how he has the whole world in his hands. Play starts going crazy. And then for the next, I don't know, two minutes, guys pe- start showing up in the crowd dressed as characters from Bray Wyatt's past. Here's a dude in a pig mask. Here's a dude in a Hawaiian shirt. You mean shirt. Huskus. Thank you, Brian. Here's Huskus. A Huskus mask. Huskus. Ah, God. That that's, the greatest, that's the greatest WWE name in history. Huskus. The pig. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> for clarifying. Yeah. <laughs> Not Huskus the snake or Huskus the no. weasel. No. <laughs> Huskus, Huskus is the, the pig. Gotcha. The There's fat a dude pig. In a, dude in a Hawaiian shirt. The, the the straw hat on. There's a dude in a bunny suit. Some of these I didn't even know. There was just some guy in a scary costume. I couldn't identify what the hell it was. Uh, I think that was supposed to be the fiend. Well, no, I saw the fiend. Okay, there's a different one. I didn't know what it was. And there's then like some a guy in a Hawaiian shirt and a chicken head. It's a buzzard. Follow the buzzards, bro. Okay. All right. Uh, a scary mask just appears in the commentary desk, and they're all freaked out. We do see the fiend. And then we see a doorway appear on the stairs, on the stair, a stage. There's a doorway on the stage, and there's a spooky light coming from behind it. Uh, we see on this big screen an even more warped version of the Firefly Funhouse. It's all covered in cobwebs. All the puppet characters are out laying around, covered in dust and cobwebs, and uh, just left out. And uh, finally, the door appears. The door opens. There's a scary blue light. Out steps Bray Wyatt. He is wearing a new scary mask. So you saw the black phone and copied that. There are words being said I did not understand. And uh, he's there with a blue light, blue lantern, his scary mask. Unmasks, it is in fact Bray Wyatt. It may be the camera angle, but they were... It was basically a navel-eye view looking up at him, and he appears to have been eating well in his time off. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, he says he's here. He blows out the magic blue light, and we fade the black, and the show ends. So, yes, the main event of Extreme Rules was an entrance. Yep. Hey, it was awesome. I thought this whole thing was extraordinarily well done. And the crowd went crazy for this guy's return. And the question is, now what? I guess we're going to find out here soon. But I hope it don't involve no fucking magic. And at some point, he's got to wrestle. All I know is Brian is Brian is right. There are people who absolutely love Bray Wyatt. They love the lore and all these wacky characters and all the changes in his gimmick. They love every single step. And the people... The people who love Bray Wyatt and paid attention to everything that's happened in Bray Wyatt over the past, God, close to a decade, actually. Uh, no, it's impossible. 2014 at WrestleMania, he was there against John Cena. That's close to a decade. I and mean, he was doing God the NXT before damn, that. Damn, what so, yeah. happened? We're old. We're very, very old. Uh, I get older tomorrow. Even older. That's right. Yeah, I'll never forget. 10, 10, 10. Yep. Maybe you suffer through a TNA pay-per-view. <laughs> Story of my life. Story of my life. So uh, anyway, the point is, people who love this stuff and invested their time and invested their energy and invested their emotions in caring about this character were rewarded for paying the attention and investing all their time and energy into that. That's good. This is a show done, or excuse me, a segment done for Bray Wyatt fans, and the Bray Wyatt fans got what they wanted, and I'm not going to criticize them for that. 